He's been wearing really loose clothes the last couple of weeks. He's and really just, skinny. He's really skinny, and I didn't notice till this morning because he wouldn't like. I asked him if he's okay, and he would not answer me. Like he's fifteen. He's been in a small Michigan town. A seemingly normal family hid unimaginable horrors behind closed doors. What began as a shocking discovery led to a gripping courtroom drama. You see what I'm looking at here? Yeah. She's a liar. She's lied to you about so much stuff. This is the haunting tale of Timothy. Stay with us as we uncover the dark secrets and the chilling journey to justice that left a community forever changed. Our mission is to shed light on the darkest corners of human behavior and honor the victims whose voices were silenced. If you believe in uncovering the truth and standing up for those who can't, hit that subscribe button and join our community. Together, we can make a difference. Now let's get into the story of Timothy, a case that will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew about the people closest to you. Your mother used you. She's so smart. She's smarter than any of us here. She's smarter than me. She's smarter than any detective here. She's smarter than our chief of police here. She's smarter than all of us. Timothy Ferguson came into this world on August 6, 2006, in Charlotte, North Carolina. His parents were Eric Nolan and Shanda Ferguson. Timothy was the fourth child out of Shanda's five. Timothy had blonde hair that turned brown as he grew, light blue eyes, and a big bright smile. He was diagnosed with autism, ADHD, and had some speech and motor difficulties. We've heard some testimony as to uh, Timothy's special needs. What were his special needs? He was on the autism spectrum, but he was completely verbal, and he was grade level in school. He was not behind the school at all. Um, Loud noises bothered him a lot, but none of that mattered to his siblings. He was just their little brother. They called him Tim and loved him dearly. His oldest brother once said, Tim was a sweet boy who loved hugs and high fives. With pain and remorse for every hug, high five, and I loved you that I might have missed in the time that I had with my sweet baby brother. School was his happy place, and he did well in his classes. He loved trains, especially Thomas the Tank Engine, and enjoyed tinkering with things. Timothy was so smart. He could take anything apart with any tools, or none at all. He had trouble focusing, but when he did, he was just as smart as the rest of his class. He made people angry, yes, but then he would look at you with those big baby blue eyes and you'd never stay mad at him. Between 2009 and 2012, the family was living in Oklahoma. During this period, Child Protective Services, CPS, got involved. Timothy was listed as malnourished, underweight, and failing to thrive. Around November 2009, the kids were taken into CPS custody. Shanda was frustrated that CPS wouldn't return the kids or increase visitation. She never admitted any wrongdoing. Instead, she blamed the caseworker and supervisor, saying their stupidity caused all these problems. This caused a lot of rift between Eric and Shanda, and by June 2010, their marriage was over. By July 2010, she was posting about finding a guy who calls you beautiful. A man named Adam van der Ark commented that he loved her, and she replied that she loved him too. Adam, who used a wheelchair, lived in Michigan. Over the next two years, the children stayed in CPS custody while Shanda and Eric went through a bitter divorce and custody battle. In January 2012, Shanda stopped fighting for custody and visitation. She signed paperwork agreeing to supervised visits with the kids for only three hours a month and to pay child support. Although she agreed to waive her rights voluntarily, her parental rights were never officially terminated. Did the ex-husband ever make any, ex any effort to transfer legal custody to you? Um, we discussed it, but he never did actually sign anything, no sir. Okay. With Shanda out of the family home, CPS returned custody to Eric. After the divorce, Shanda rarely saw the children. She married Adam van der Ark and changed her last name. In late 2014, she gave birth to Gabriel, Timothy's younger brother. In 2016, Shanda graduated from Liberty University with a Bachelor of Science in Paralegal Studies. By 2018, she had applied to three law schools and was accepted by all of them. Back in Oklahoma, Shanda's children were growing up. Nolan turned 18 and started his life as a young adult. But when Paul turned 18, he wasn't quite ready to grow up. He and his dad weren't getting along. Paul was angry because Eric Sr. wanted him to work two part-time jobs, 
two different jobs. Two different jobs? Did you say you were working? Yeah, no, I used to work two different uh, jobs. I heard you say that in Oklahoma. Oh, okay. Because so I think the brother was like, I want work two jobs. And you're like, mm-hmm. Then you don't have to go. Four hours of sleep maximum was a nightmare. That's a joke. That's not even funny. Actually, no. Oh. Um... Yeah, four hours is a time of lot. Dude, honestly, that's what kind of jobs are you doing? Fast food. Okay. To get away from his dad's expectations, Paul moved to Michigan to live with Shanda. In 2020, he got a part-time job as a dishwasher and helped his mom and Adam take care of Gabriel. What, what was your job at that time? I worked as a dishwasher at Applebee's. And was that which Applebee's? Um, the one in Grand Haven right off the bridge. A few months after Paul joined the household, Shanda and Adam moved into a split-level house on Marshall Road in Norton Shores. They had a large private backyard and a bedroom downstairs for Gabriel and Paul. Adam and Shanda lived in the upper section of the home. They installed a camera with an intercom so Adam could see and talk to the kids whenever they were downstairs since the lower level wasn't accessible by wheelchair. In May of 2021, Timothy moved to Michigan to be with Shanda and him. When did Timothy come to your care? May of 2021. Prior to that, who had physical and legal custody of Timothy? My ex-husband. Eric and his new wife had recently separated, and Eric had moved to Florida. Eric pulled Timothy out of school two days before the end of the school year. Uh, were you able to get Timothy enrolled in school specifically? No, we were not. We tried to enroll him in Mona Shores High School, and, um, Mona Shores told me that my ex, I guess Timothy had damaged a Chromebook in Oklahoma, and because my ex owed money on that, they would not send his records up to us. So we were not able to enroll him. So, I found an online homeschool curriculum that I had to monitor, but I enrolled him in that. At the Norton Shores house, a bunk bed was set up for Timothy in the open area of the basement outside the doors to Gabriel and Paul's rooms. Shanda believed that Timothy was faking his special needs. Timothy was supposed to be on medicine for his ADHD, but Shanda took him off the meds. And without legal custody, how do you get Timothy into school? You can't. And without legal custody, how do you get medical treatment for Timothy? You can't. Did your husband at least send his medical insurance card for Timothy? He did not send it to me. I requested his insurance card, and he never sent it to me. She never once took him to the doctor during his time there. Timothy really enjoyed going to school in Oklahoma, but Shanda decided to homeschool him instead. And he goes to school and everything. I've been homeschooling him online. He's high-functioning, and he's just done better at it. I can show you his grade report online. I've got all the grades online. Is he doing okay? Yeah, he was. I mean, he was failing math, which is not unusual, but he was passing everything else. She had him complete assignments on a tablet, and he was only allowed to go outside to walk the dogs. Did Timothy go to school? Not public, no. How was he schooled? At home. And when you say homeschool, what did that entail? At first, it was assignments on a tablet. Then my mother restricted it to where she would print out the assignments, and he would sit downstairs and do them. Shanda graduated from law school, second in her class. A few months later, she took the bar exam. She passed on her first attempt with a score of 182, a very high score that put her in the top 1% of Michigan test takers. Adam had a stroke on January 3, 2022. Adam survived the medical emergency, and on January 10, he went to a rehabilitation center to recover. Despite his best efforts though, he remained in need of constant care. Instead of returning to his home with Shanda, he moved in with his parents. What was your financial situation once Timothy arrived and your husband had a stroke? After the stroke, we lost my husband's income. It was paycheck to pay, not even paycheck to paycheck. Almost everything was paid late. I was struggling. I asked Paul for help with groceries sometimes because we were struggling. Okay, and Paul was working full-time? He was working part-time. He was working at Applebee's. Yes, sir. So the entire financial burden was on you. Correct. Could you have afforded daycare for any of your children? Absolutely not. No. After Adam left, conditions in the Norton Shores home changed drastically. You talked about some of the special needs that Timothy had when he came to live with you. 
What was his overall physical appearance like when he first came to live with you? He wasn't skinny, but he wasn't extremely overweight. He had a good amount of chubbiness to him, so he was a little chubby. Yes, like many kids, Timothy had a sweet tooth and liked candy and other snacks. Sometimes he would take food without asking, like Pop-Tarts that Paul had purchased. He would also get into things because he liked taking them apart. Shanda started noticing that Timothy was acting out and wasn't potty trained. He would make noises or cause distractions, but he was never violent. He was often hungry and hoarded food. He also had bladder accidents, and at his old school, they dealt with him by letting him shower and giving him clean clothes. They'd given him an adult diaper to help prevent accidents and sent him home with his backpack full of food and snacks. Can you tell me, did he like to take things apart? Oh yes, absolutely. Can you give some examples? He took batteries apart. He took toys apart, my youngest son's toys. Shanda worked for the judge from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and Paul worked as a dishwasher at Applebee's from 4 p.m. to close. Since there were times that neither of them could be home, Shanda needed a way to restrain and watch Timothy when she wasn't there. They already had one camera, but she soon bought several others. The next question I have for you, you had monitors and cameras in your home, is that correct? Yes, sir. And the impression from the testimony I heard is that it was for the purpose, the sole purpose of ensuring that Timothy could not get to food. Is that accurate? No. Why did you have all those monitors and cameras in your home? When Timothy came to live with us, his stepmother informed me that they had motion sensors. They weren't as tech-savvy as I was. I worked in tech before law school. I worked in tech for several years. But they had motion sensors because she told me that she didn't sleep at night, only when he was at school. She bought locks for the refrigerator, freezer, and pantry. She bought motion detectors to set up around the house. So you set up these video and audio cameras, correct? Yes, sir. And alarms on the doors? Those didn't get installed until about three weeks before he passed away. And motion sensors? Yes, sir. He got around the motion sensors multiple times. Were you able to stay home and personally monitor your children? No, I had to work full-time. It was a high-tech operation. Five cameras and multiple sensors communicated with an app that Shanda and Paul installed on their phones. They could open the app and watch him, as well as get motion alerts sent directly to their phones. At some point, did you utilize some type of alarm or alarms on his body to alert you if he was moving? A vibration detector, yes. Was there more than one that he was required to wear at times? At times, yes. Where were those devices located on his body? They were normally tied to the back loop of his belt or the back loop of his pants. They also communicated extensively through text, mostly Shanda giving orders and Paul explaining how he followed them or failed to. In April, Timothy managed to get the locks off the kitchen doors, and Shanda made Paul put them back on. Timothy was so hungry that he would eat anything he could get his hands on. They installed a camera in the closet so they could monitor him while he slept, and a motion detector so he had to remain still. An alarm on the closet door beeped loud enough to be heard several rooms away. In March, Shanda became convinced that Timothy was setting off the alarms on purpose, assuming he intentionally kept everyone in the house awake by intentionally setting off the motion detectors. Did Timothy have to wash his sheets? Question mark. Yes, I said okay. Pretty sure that is him pouting over the extra camera and motion sensors. After Adam moved in with his parents, Gabriel often visited him there, sometimes staying for several days. Gabriel's grandmother picked him up from the house in Norton Shores. Shonda worked with Paul to ensure Granny never entered the house or saw Timothy. Shonda used the family's cell phone account to track Granny's route, texting Paul to warn him and keep Granny out. Granny left home about 10 minutes ago. Hopefully, she will not beat me there this time, but please have him ready to go and please keep a very close eye on your messages. I will track her on the app as I head home. Hey, I need to see to make sure you're seeing these messages, and please make sure his new shoes are on him, okay? Thank you. And do not, do not, do not let Granny inside! Exclamation point. Yes, sir, he replied. During one of Gabriel's visits, Adam had a seizure and was once again hospitalized. The next day, June 13th, Paul texted Shonda. Although Paul showed some kindness that day, the next day he texted Shonda to say Timothy complained about being hungry all day. As the months passed, Timothy became thinner and thinner. 
Any time he appeared unresponsive, Shonda was convinced he was faking it to trick them. On July 5th, Timothy was unresponsive when Paul tried to wake him. Paul yelled and screamed at him, but he didn't move. He was unresponsive when I went to. When I was told to get him up, so you were given some instructions to wake him up in the morning? Yes. Was your mother already up? Yes. Were the cameras activated at that point? Yes. So your responsibility when you had to go wake him up was what? Just to do what? To get him up, um, just wake him up, which normally wasn't difficult before then but... And this is the day before he passed away. But was it difficult on that day? Very. Did you scream at him and yell at him to try to wake him up? Yes. That day, Shonda spent half her workday watching the camera and sending messages to Paul. Normally, Paul would have ridden his e-bike to work at 4 p.m., but he had a flat tire, so he needed to wait for a ride from Shonda. When she got home around 6 p.m., they left Timothy in the tub while she drove Paul to Applebee's for his shift. So you put him in the tub around 2. Did your mom come home at 6? Yes. And when your mom gets home at 6, did you go to work at that point in time? She drove me to work, yes. Was Timothy still in the tub at that point in time? Yes. On the morning of July 6th, Paul got up early to get a ride to work. Shonda was already awake and told him that Timothy was in the closet and not breathing. They dragged him out, shouted his name, and tried to wake him up. Shonda told Paul they needed to perform CPR and ordered him to give rescue breaths. Paul gagged, saying there was something wet in his mouth, but continued following his mother's orders. They tried to get him to drink water and continued CPR. They had no clue what to do. After several minutes of attempted CPR, Paul asked if they should call 911. Shonda said, not yet, so they dressed him in a pair of Paul's pants and a hoodie. What was he wearing when he came out of the room? Nothing but an adult diaper. At some point, did you put clothes on him? Yes. Who put the clothes on him? Um, both me and Shonda, per Shonda's request or order, however you'd like to phrase it. So before he was wearing the diaper, and you put clothes on him while he was unresponsive outside of the small room? Yes. And what clothes did you put on? A hoodie, a pair of my jeans. She told Paul they would have to lie and say Timothy had gone on a hunger strike. She instructed him to tell the police that Timothy had been sleeping on the loft bed instead of in the closet. Eighteen minutes later, Shonda finally called 911. Almost immediately, she started telling the fabricated story she had concocted. She claimed she checked on him at 5.30 a.m. and that he had been breathing then, which was also a lie. She again attempted CPR, following the dispatcher's instructions. The dispatcher told her to slow down because she was doing the compressions too fast. When the first responders arrived, they were unable to revive Timothy. He had died overnight in the closet, though the exact details of his death wouldn't be clear until much later. When police interviewed Shonda at the house, she concocted stories to explain everything, frequently becoming emotional and crying. You have another son inside the house? I'm two. Are they sleeping still right now? One of them is, yeah. The 20-year-old's awake. He's 20? No, the 20-year-old's awake. Oh, okay. She said she had planned to call the doctor that day because she was worried. She also claimed he had done this before, going on a hunger strike. Inside the home, police noticed locks on the fridge, freezer, and pantry. When police asked about the locks, Shanda said she installed them because Timothy was always leaving the appliances and pantry doors open. At some point in time, did the police leave you guys alone in the home later that night? Yes. And when that happened, did Shanda do anything with any of the items in the house? She disposed of evidence. What did she dispose of? Vibration detectors, a camera upstairs that was not confiscated. She broke the memory chip that was inside into four pieces and threw them out the window as we were driving to Grandma and Grandpa Vander Arches. When asked about the leg shackles, she said they belonged to Paul, who was using them to make a video. The motion alarms, she claimed, were there to ensure the boys didn't get into her sewing supplies. She also said Timothy had fallen out of his bed the night before. When police questioned Paul, Shanda often jumped in and answered for him, trying to control the narrative and protect herself from the consequences of their horrific actions. Have you been talking to him at all recently? I talked to him yesterday morning to get him up. That started. Did you know that he was on this hunger strike? I think I... 
Huh. I mean, did I tell you or not? I don't know if I did or not. No, I don't think you did. He's skin and bone. I know. Just, how did he, he's really? Well, he, he doesn't communicate with him hard at all. Like, they say hi, and they don't. Yeah. Are you guys full brothers or half brothers? They're full. The only half is the one that's in there. Okay. Mir Shanda thought she had everything under control with those security cameras. Little did she know they were capturing more than just live images for her phone. The police also talked to Gabriel, the seven-year-old, who spilled enough to help lead to Shanda's arrest the next day. When they came to arrest Shanda, she didn't take it quietly. Tears, claims of hypoglycemia making her sick, and a bit of theatrics followed, but she still ended up in jail. After being questioned, Paul went on social media, sitting with a dog beside him. He shared the somber news. When I can't actually get in contact with you guys, I'll probably post quick checks like this. For those of you who aren't aware, my little brother has passed away, and my mother is currently in the custody of... Well, I'm not sure if it's on July 8, 2022. Shanda faced arraignment for open murder in the first degree in Michigan, held without bond in the Mason County Jail. Shanda awaited trial. Later, on July 21, Paul was arrested with a hefty $500,000 bond. I know that we talked yesterday, and I know that not everything that we talked about was the truth yesterday. That's okay, you don't have to feel bad. You don't have to feel guilty about not telling the truth to me, okay? I want you to focus on yourself right now and think about what's best for you, and let's try to get to the truth of what really happened with your brother, because he deserves that. It's okay. I know it's okay. I feel so guilty, like I could have done something at any point in this. We didn't want any of this. We never wanted him to be injured or hurt. I loved him so much. Yeah, I can tell that. I can certainly tell that. He stayed in jail until after Shanda's trial. I just feel like I could have done something. I should have put my foot down at some point. If you had, what would have happened with your mom? I don't know. Maybe something would have been different. Maybe he would still be alive. I promised him before the whole thing with mom and dad, that my mom and dad would protect him, but I failed so hard. Initially denying much, Paul eventually broke under the weight of recovered text messages. What I do want you to know, though, is that we went through the phones, okay? And we're beginning to go through the phones, and there's a lot of evidence in the phones. And I know that you're kind of aware of communication between yourself and your mother and those sorts of things, and that's kind of what I want to talk to you about. He tried defending Shanda for a while. We want... We... We want him to be healthy. I know that for a fact. We just, we should have been so much. I should have at least put my foot down on something. He's getting these ice baths. I know there's numerous of them, right? I mean, cause I've read through the messages. How are you getting the ice? Like, where's it coming from? We have an ice machine upstairs. It's not allotted, can barely create any. That's enough to make it a full honor. But, but it's a deal in exchange for a guilty plea to first-degree, murder, and testimony against Shonda. Chief Trial Prosecutor Matt Roberts assured Paul that his testimony wouldn't be used against him in future trials. So, tell me what really happened in the morning then, the detective said, because obviously what was told to us wasn't the truth. What really, what really happened when you guys, somebody found him, or I woke up and I had been grabbing my shoes, and it was, it was at that point that it basically all played out like we said. The whole morning thing was exact. He wasn't breathing in the closet. It was the closet, though. We had to get him out of the closet to try and resuscitate him. So it's you and mother in the closet, the detective asked. We did get him out. We tried to revive. Was it? Who noticed him first? You or my mother? Okay. Did she ask you via text to check on him on the way up? That's not what happened. She said, hey. Can you check on him on your way upstairs? Do you remember that text message at all? No. Okay, there might have been one that I didn't see, but okay. So, you guys pull him out of the closet and we tried to assess it. We gave him rescue breaths. His breath smelled horrible. I thought maybe he might have still been capable of being resuscitated because his mouth was still wet, so I thought maybe it had just been recent so we could, we could do something. She cared, he said. But when Paul tried to frame it as an accident, the detective intensified the questioning, poking holes in the made-up story. 
and your mother being smart and, and intelligent, and the smartest woman in the room, she didn't do anything about that? Didn't think about taking him to the doctor? Didn't think about, we have to give him some more food? Like, seriously now? Instead, what do you think she did? The detective then started grilling him on the specifics. She didn't want him around anymore because he was too much work. That's the truth. And the second you start to believe that and understand that, then I think that's the time you can move forward in this case. Until you believe that, until you understand that, you're never moving forward from this. This isn't an accident. This didn't just happen. Your mom knew exactly what was happening to him, that he was wasting away. You saw it, didn't you? You saw it happening right in front of you. And this is a crime. Did your brother deserve to die? No. Shonda's trial began on December 13, 2023, with Judge Matthew Quell presiding. Her attorney, Fred Johnson, portrayed her as a single mother striving through school, arguing she never intended harm to Timothy. Prosecutor Roberts found Shonda's defense perplexing, questioning how someone with her legal acumen and experience in parenthood could plead ignorance to the consequences of her actions. During cross-examination, the prosecutor confronted Shonda with a picture of Timothy's body. This is ours before he dies, right? Yes, sir. He looked like that when you put him in the bathtub. After this dramatic display, Shonda's attorney requested a break, and court ended for the day. However, the next day, Shonda didn't return to court. She informed the court she was suffering from a medical issue and would not be returning for the remainder of the trial. Meanwhile, video footage recovered from the memory card of the camera installed in Timothy's closet on his last night alive was described in chilling detail by the detective. The footage was deemed too disturbing to be shown to the jury directly. After two hours of discussing the case, Shonda was convicted of first-degree murder. During the sentencing hearing, Judge Quell expressed that the sentencing guidelines of 11 to 19 years didn't reflect the extent of Timothy's enduring suffering, so he chose to surpass those guidelines. Shonda received a life sentence without parole for Timothy's murder, with an additional 50 to 100 years for first-degree neglect. She remained silent throughout the sentencing hearing. During Paul's sentencing hearing, Judge Quell emphasized Paul's challenging upbringing of neglect and trauma, which contributed significantly to his actions. Is there, as you sit there right now, do you? Do you love Timothy? I suppose I didn't love him enough. It's why I'm trying to bring justice for him. Just a moment. Just a moment. But can I say that I loved him during the time before his death? Yes. Did you love him before his death? With all the ways I acted, I cannot. Paul admitted during evaluation sessions to feeling power and pleasure in disciplining Timothy. Past incidents revealed aggression towards siblings and joy in tormenting Timothy, which led to conflicts at home. Paul's behavioral issues extended to cruelty toward animals, theft, bullying, and anger management difficulties. Concerned about Paul's potential development of psychopathic traits like his mother's, Judge, Quell, sentenced Paul to 30 to 100 years in prison. The story of Timothy is one of unseen horrors that can occur behind closed doors. Timothy was laid to rest at the Sunset Memory Garden Cemetery in Mint Hill, North Carolina. The boy who once adored Thomas the Tank Engine now rests under a headstone engraved with a train. If you were moved by his story and believe in the importance of justice, please subscribe to our channel. Your support helps us continue to bring these crucial stories to light. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss an update. We want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on Paul's sentence? Leave your comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. If you or someone you know is in a similar situation, please seek help immediately. Share this video to raise awareness, as together we can make a difference. Until next time, stay safe, stay informed, and keep fighting for justice.